from distant galaxies to water in the asteroid belt, and even part of the telescope going wrong again. There is a lot of JWST news to keep up with. Here we'll cover all of the recent news that hasn't yet been discussed on this channel, so let's dive straight in. We'll start with a beautiful picture of a galaxy. This brilliant beacon is known as ARP 220, and it's two spiral galaxies in the process of merging, a violent event that takes millions of years. This is an excellent type of galaxy for JWST to image, because it's particularly bright in infrared wavelengths. It's over a trillion times brighter than the Sun, and is known as an ultraluminous infrared galaxy, or an ULERG for short. For comparison, our own Milky Way galaxy is only about 2 billion times the brightness of the Sun, making ARP 220 about a thousand times brighter than us. It's the nearest ULIRG to us, at about 250 million light years away, and the two galaxies began merging about 700 million years ago. This caused an incredibly large amount of stars to form in the galaxy, as all of that galactic dust and gas smashed together and eventually collapsed under gravity. This image was made with both near-infrared and mid-infrared light from JWST's NERCAM and MIRI instruments, and the picture is dominated by the huge six-pronged diffraction spikes that prove exactly how bright the galaxy is. Throughout the rest of the image are wisps of orange gas and purple and blue bubbles and nebulae. The bright core is very dense with stars, with many of them forming nearby due to the overcrowding of dust and gas while on the outskirts of the merger we can see faint tidal tails too. This is material being drawn off of the merging galaxies by gravity as they interact, demonstrating the beautiful, albeit very violent, dance that these two galaxies are doing. Slightly closer to home now, and JWST has achieved the first ever confirmation of water vapour around a comet in the main asteroid belt using its NERSPEC instrument to do spectroscopy. That's the breaking down of light into its component wavelengths. The telescope saw water around an object called Comet Reed. This proves that water can survive for a really long time in the belt. When we split the light we receive into its component wavelengths, like a prism splits visible light into a rainbow, certain features can tell us about specific elements and molecules being present in the object that emitted that light. Here we see a feature that very much reveals the presence of water on this comet. However, one puzzling thing is that the comet has absolutely no evidence of carbon dioxide being present around it, unlike pretty much all other comets. Comet Reed is something known as a main belt comet. It's a comet living in the asteroid belt. Main belt comet just means that it's an object in the main asteroid belt of the solar system, between Mars and Jupiter. But as it orbits the Sun, it periodically displays a halo and tail just like a comet does. And in fact, Comet Reed was one of a group of three objects to be the very first given this classification. Before these objects, we thought that all comets originated in the Kuiper Belt and Oort clouds in the far reaches of the solar system, where it's easily cold enough to preserve ice for a long time. The story then went that these comets got somehow kicked out of the belt and started to orbit closer to the Sun. As they got closer, those ices could melt and release gases to form the halo and tail. Now we know that it's possible to keep ice ice around much closer to the Sun, and we also know that these tails in the asteroid belt are caused by water ice melting and releasing vapour. To be honest, this was all predicted but unconfirmed until now. But the bigger surprise here was the lack of CO2. This gas usually makes up about 10% of a comet's tail and halo, so to see none here is unusual. This could be because the comet formed in a region that was too hot and didn't have any CO2 in it. Or alternatively, the comet could have had some CO2 when it formed, but it's all essentially boiled off in the asteroid belt over the last billion years or so. Both options are possible, and we don't know which one is correct just yet. I think this result is particularly cool, because it might give a clue as to how water got onto Earth in the first place. Our planet has a lot of water, and we really don't understand where all of it came from. But one leading theory is that it was inside comets that collided with a baby Earth. Now that we know comets can definitely contain water, this gives that idea a little more weight, and we're starting to understand the history of water in the solar system a little bit better. Maybe one day we could even send a probe to a comet like this and bring a sample back home to study, but that is a topic for another day. 
Moving on to some more troubling news, and it relates to the mid-infrared instrument MIRI. Like everything on JWST, this instrument can be run in a few different observing modes, and one of them is experiencing a small issue again. A while back, we heard that this mode, called the Medium Resolution Spectroscopy Mode, or MRS, had to stop being used for a bit, because one of the wheels that turns to let through different wavelengths of light was feeling a bit more friction than it should. This was eventually mitigated, but now the same mode has another problem. At the longest wavelengths of light that it can see, the amount of light that's ultimately reaching the sensors of MIRI was less than expected, and has in fact decreased since the commissioning of the telescope happened when it first launched and unfolded. Every mode of the telescope is routinely tested by observing standard stars whose brightness and other properties are very well catalogued by other telescopes, and MIRI is simply detecting less light than it should. Actually, imaging doesn't seem to be affected, only spectroscopy at the longest wavelengths, and the instrument itself isn't in any danger, and all of the other instruments are completely unaffected. Observations with this instrument and mode are continuing as planned, while being monitored carefully, and plans are being made to deal with the issue. The simplest solution, which is probably the one they're going to go with, will be to simply take slightly longer exposures when using this mode, to collect more light and increase the signal to noise of the data, i.e. the telescope is seeing less light, so we'll just point it at things for slightly longer to compensate. You can see this plot here showing the current issue, where the longest wavelengths are receiving less light than they were during commissioning, but by allowing new observations that use these wavelengths more time, the performance that was found during calibration can easily be recovered. Next up is a cool collaboration between JWST and Chandra, the X-ray telescope. This produced four new images that update previously seen images with X-ray sources to add to the infrared data that JWST sees. The four images include two galaxies, M74 and NGC 1672, a nearby star cluster, and the mirror shot of the Pillars of Creation. These new X-ray sources are shown in pinks and purples, and are likely to be distant, high-energy sources such as quasars. The images actually also add data from an older infrared telescope called Spitzer, visible light data from Hubble, additional X-ray data from XMM-Newton, and the European Southern Observatory's new technology telescope. This means, besides being really beautiful, they give us a pretty complete idea of what these objects look like across a huge range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Let's end with this brand new image that takes us deep inside a nearby galaxy called NGC 5068, 17 million light years away. This galaxy right here is what we're looking at, but zoomed in to focus around the very centre of this star city. It's part of a campaign to image star formation in nearby galaxies, and we've actually seen images from the same campaign previously. Here though, we got to see three images, one in near-infrared, one in mid-infrared, and then a combined shot of the two. In the mid-infrared shot, we can see deep into the galaxy, and the dust and gas lanes are shown off perfectly, giving the galaxy a really skeletal feel. In the near-infrared image, we can see hundreds of thousands of stars glittering in the galaxy, and the beautiful bar feature at the centre of the galaxy is highlighted nicely. Combined, the whole thing pops with colour as we see the stars and dust glowing together. I hope you enjoyed this recap of some of the latest JWST images and news. Subscribe if you're new, and leave me a comment down below to let me know your thoughts on any or all of this. Until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye!